Hello? 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 Hmm. Hello? Welcome. Hi. Welcome, everyone, to another installment of Zoom School, uh, hosted tonight by Art Book at Moment PS1 Bookstore and Princeton University Press. Uh, it is so good to be with you all here, and I'm grateful that we could all find the time in our busy, crazy lives these days to be here together tonight to talk and learn and listen to each other. My name is Ethan. I'm a bookseller at Artbook, where I am proud to get to touch and hold and sell all the fanciest new titles in the arts and humanities, which can't stop being published no matter what else happens. I'm zooming in tonight from the unceded traditional territory of the Lenape people, now known as Britain Beach in Brooklyn. Uh, tonight, on behalf of Artbook, it is my esteemed honor and privilege to help welcome Hal Foster and Leah Dickerman to the public stage on the occasion of the publication of Hal's most recent book, Brutal Aesthetics, Du Buffet, Batai, Yorn, Palazzi, Oldenburg, out now from Princeton University Press. I spent much of today reading the book and can confirm it is terrific. Uh, it's an incisive and wide reaching history of a particular aesthetic affinity that arose on the margins of modernist art practice in the early Cold War. It is a cold aesthetic. Uh, concerned with annihilation and disfiguration that Hal identifies and unfolds across its various forms in the body's work of our five title figures. Hal Foster is the Townsend Martin Class of 1917 Professor of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University and is the author of too many books to list. Brutal Aesthetics is the most recent installment of his larger project to rethink the 20th century avant-garde at times of political emergency. That's a direct quote from the introduction of the book and I'm eager to hear more from him tonight about how their emergencies reflect and illuminate ours and why these artists now. Joining Hal in conversation tonight is Leah Dickerman, the Director of Editorial and Content Strategy at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the curator or co-curator of multiple award-winning exhibitions, as well as the author or co-author of these exhibitions award-winning catalogs. Leah and Hal are longstanding colleagues and old friends, most notably from the journal October, where they have been working together as writers and on the editorial board for over 20 years. Together, the two will be taking us on a whirlwind art historical tour of the disfigured and destroyed from the caves of Lascaux to the fallout fields of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to today's moment of ambient emergency all over the world. Hal and Leah will talk for around half an hour before opening the conversation up to you all in the audience but feel free at any point to type questions into the Q&A box down below. I'm gonna pop back in before too long and do my best to make sure every question gets heard. Um, if you are so moved at any moment, I put a link in the chat on the side where you can order the book from us. We can have copies signed by Hal. We will have copies signed by Hal available to ship very soon from the bookstore. Um, this event is also being streamed live on YouTube and being recorded for our YouTube and Instagram archives. So. Without further ado, please welcome Hal Foster and Leah Dickerman. Hi. Thanks, uh, Ethan, and thanks to Artbook for um, having me. Modernism teaches us how to survive civilization, Walter Benjamin wrote enigmatically in the early 1930s. It had to teach us, and we had to learn, Benjamin thought, because the humanist tradition had failed to prevent both the devastation of a world war and the violence of fascist politics. Civilization had thus become barbaric in its own right. To this perverse turn in history, Benjamin answered with a dialectical twist of thought. Modernism teaches us how to survive a barbaric civilization through a positive barbarism of its own one that aims to be equal to the new poverty of experience at large. These are his terms. And among his uh, idiosyncratic examples, he mentions the schematic figures of Paul Clay and the stark facades of Adolf Loos. What does poverty of experience do for the barbarian, Benjamin asks? It forces him to start from scratch, to make a new start, to make a little go a long way. 
Like everyone else, Benjamin thought the worst had come with World War I, with what he called the tiny, fragile human body caught in a force field of destructive torrents and explosions. But in fact, the worst didn't arrive until the mass deaths of World War II, the Holocaust, and the bomb. Only then was one truly forced to start from scratch, to make a new start, to make a little go a long way. In these circumstances, what ground could artists and writers find? What means adequate to the destruction all around them? What but the most basic, the most brutal? In this book, I'm interested in the pervasive turn from the middle 1940s to the middle 1960s, to the brute and the brutalist, the animal and the creaturely, as these are manifest in the early work of Jean de Buffet, George Bataille, Esker Yorn, Eduardo Pelozzi, and Klaus Oldenburg. Each of these figures proposes a different version of brutal aesthetics, one that strips art down or reveals it to be already bare in order to begin again. But to what ends exactly? Why does de Buffet invent the notion of art brute or raw art? What does Bataille seek in the prehistoric cave paintings of France? Why does Yorn populate his cobra paintings with creaturely figures? What does Pelosi see in his monsters assembled from industrial debris? And why does Oldenburg remake cheap products from urban scrap? We'll skip back to the buffet. To begin again is almost a contradiction in terms. These figures want a clean slate only to find an overwritten one. They seek foundations only to find that they are equivocal. Like Robinson Crusoe, whom de Buffet and Oldenburg adopted as a persona, each washes up on an island of his own devising, only to discover that it too is treacherous rain. Among the, the tricky questions I encountered, encountered along the way are these. Why would de Buffet imagine, or how could he imagine, an art unscathed by culture? What did Bataille hope to unlock in the enigma, again his term, of a first man depicted as a hybrid beast? Why did Yorn figure a political crisis in the form of human animals? How did Pelosi pick out a path to survival through the ruins around him? And why did Oldenburg stake his hope for metamorphosis in junk? Some of my figures, such as Dubuffet and Oldenburg, are well known. Others, such as Jorn and Pelosi, are less so, at least in this country. In each case, though, I focus on early work, well, I, not with the exception of Pattaya, I suppose, and highlight aspects that are less familiar. For instance, I take up Bataille, the post-war prehistorian, not the pre-war dissident surrealist. In doing so, I aim to reposition, even to revalue, these artists and writers. At the same time, I don't apologize for the ways that they, all straight white men, were marked by the racism and sexism of their time. Let me just um, offer a few more themes that come up in the book. Uh, oops. Now, one theme is, of course, our brute and the the first avatar for Du Buffet of Art Brut is the child, of course. Uh, but um, he, he picks up this, this avatar, this idea of the Art Brut, only to ditch it. Uh, he comes to see child art as too dictionary. This is his phrase that far from uh, prior to culture, they want to become very cultural. Uh, and they have signs for everything like uh, a figure or a house is uh, represented again and again in the same way. He then moves on to the graffiti of the common man or the man on the street, as he calls him. And he confronts the, the same problem here. He thinks uh, the graffiti is, 
is hostile, another form of outside hostile to civilization, only to see that it, it's quite automatic, quite scripted, that it too has its own language. So he ditches it in turn. And he proceeds to uh, Art Brut Avatar 3, The Art of the Insane. Uh, and that becomes problematic too. But in each instance, he, he seeks it outside only to uh, acculturate it, only to foreclose it even. Um, and that, that becomes his, his double bind again and again. He, so he, he seeks a, a clean slate only to find it overwritten again and again. But he does also raise um, a question that, that runs throughout the book, which is the beginnings, um, obviously here with childbirth, um, the way that uh, the child cannot help but enter into a family, uh, into a society, into a language. That is also the concern of Bataille as he turns to the caves. Lascaux is, is discovered in 1940 and it re history and he's taken um, by this project too. And he, he seeks in the caves um, the riddle of origins of the human, of the sexual, the sacred, of representation indeed of art. But he too is, is caught up in a, in a double bind or at least a, a, an enigma that he can't uh, see through, which is even as the human emerges, it, it, um, it falls somehow before the animal. He interprets the stick figure here um, as a dead man um, who is almost self-sacrificed in, um, because uh, he feels that he's committed the sacrilege to break the natural order, to rise above the animal. So as the human emerges, the, the animal is both below the human, but then suddenly also above the human, it also becomes the figure of the divine. And that's how Bataille in part puzzles the riddle of why in caves, uh, the animals are so often depicted with such grace and humans, which are very rare actually, are, are depicted as formless, as en form. So, his pursuit of origins to his pursuit of a ground again uh, also becomes um, difficult, shifty, enigmatic. Now, one thing um, that came up again and again as I kind of delved into this material that I didn't expect was this interest in sovereignty. I mean, we're in the post-war period. There are regimes that have fallen, new regimes that have have risen. So it shouldn't have surprised me, but um, of course, the question of sovereignty is a key one in Bataille, but even figures like Palozzi take it up. Um, what is it to, to image power at this moment? What is it to think authority? Uh, he, um, as a member of the independent group, finds it not only in the political realm, but in the mass cultural realm. I mean, part of his concern Again, he shares this with his, his colleagues in the independent group is how to recover a myth-making capability from mass culture. Uh, he speaks again and again of image breaking and God making, of God breaking and image making. So this question of sovereignty is, is another one that, that runs through the book. Uh, then there are also these shifts um, that I, I couldn't help but note. Um, between the pre-war and the post-war, again, models of practice, figures of the artist. So it seemed to me anyway, that the, um, the famous figure of the artist is engineer, made emblematic by Elozitsky here, of course, of the, the artist who can construct a new world, that that gives away to the, the figure of the bricoleur, an artist who works with bits and pieces, who, uh, Attempts, attempts to assemble the wreckage of the time into a new order. And this idea of bricolage, even, even then it was a bit of a cliche, but it, it does emerge uh, through Levi-Strauss in part in relation to Art Brut. One of the first instances that he gives of the bricolure is the Art Brut artist. 
just quickly another um, shift uh, here in the, the figure of the animal. In Mark, um, perhaps the animal is an emblem of pure vision. He says wonderfully at one point, what is it to see the world as a deer sees the world? Uh, but by the moment of yorn, the animal is distorted. It becomes a figure of a denatured world. And the, the term that I use, and I borrow it from Eric Santner, is the creaturely. It's a, a, a figure not of, of purity, but of impurity, of even of obscenity, of, of what it is, um, Santner argues, and I argue with him, uh, what it is to feel power uh, in an obscene way, to feel exposed to power. And in Yorn, it becomes again and again a, a figure of a crisis in sovereignty, a crisis in political life. Then finally, just to go back to this idea that launched the book of positive barbarism in Benjamin, it's not only artists like Clay, uh, as figures of this new um, survivalist modernism. He also looks to Mickey Mouse, and he, he, but he means the very early uh, Mickey films that had begun to circulate uh, in Germany and Europe at the time. Uh, and he sees in Mickey this figure who can survive um, the onslaughts of, of the world and even thrive. That, you know, he's, Benjamin says of Mickey that he can lose a limb and still carry on. But he's, he's a figure of, of metamorphosis in disaster. And I, metamorphosis is another theme that runs through this book. It's very important to Pelosi in particular, but also Oldenburg. And of course, Mickey is, is key to Oldenburg as well. Um, but it's a, a metamorphosis that, as, as with bricolage, is, it mixes construction with destruction. I mean, this motto, annihilate, illuminate, Oldenburg is, is similar to a, a motto in Pelosi. His is illuminate, co coagulate. But I, I love this little uh, drawing uh, by Oldenburg of his ray gun. And you can see the little title and subtitle underneath, annihilate, illuminate. It shoots out equal signs, you know, metamorphic equations um, whereby a ice cream cone can turn into a mouse. Uh, a mouse maybe into a mountain, a ray gun into uh, a female leg and, and so on. Um, Oldenburg, uh, like Pelosi, wanted to reanimate object relations. Um, they wanted to de-reify. Uh, and I, I think that that was for them a very difficult project. And by the, um, by the mid 1960s, late 1960s, the Mouse Museum of Oldenburg begins to see more and more like a mausoleum. But there are other themes to talk about, but maybe I should uh, open it up to Leah at this point. Um, Leah, should, we, should we leave the, uh, the images on in case you want to look at any of them? Or? Sure, and you can flip them if, if you want to bring one up while we're speaking. Sure. Um, but let's just begin by saying congratulations, Hal. Um, you know, I was struck as I was reading it about how profoundly original um, this kind of framing was to hold five artists together who are so different um, and what it meant to think about these themes across their work. And I wondered how you came to this. I mean, was, I know, I can imagine how you might've run across Benjamin's enigmatic idea of a modernism that teaches us how to survive civilization and even putting that idea in your pocket in a way and sitting with it for a while. But how did you come to a moment where you said there's something that these artists have in common um, that I can connect th this way? Was that a eureka moment or something else? Uh, I wish it were a eureka moment. Um, I don't have many. Uh, I was actually asked to do these lectures. So was, there was a disciplinary voice that said, come up with five or six talks. Um, but no, it, the, uh, I, I love this idea, I mean, grim as it is, of um, positive barbarism. And it, I think it does open out a, a different idea of modernism. 
for me, Benjamin um, located it too early. I mean, one re reason I think why he didn't develop the idea, I mean, he mentions it a few times, but he never develops it, is that I'm not sure how adequate it is to his moment. For me, it's really the, the post-war moment when it becomes almost uh, problematic. That's not to say that um, there's anything particularly intentional or united uh, in the practices of these artists, but it was a, a way for me to to bring them together. And um, in a way, this this is a, a step, a, an installment in a long project. I mean, Ethan mentioned it at the outset, which is to think about the avant-garde uh, of the 20th century at times of emergency. In other words, at, at times when um, there's not uh, a stable law in place. Um, usually think of the avant-garde as one which trans transgresses a law that's oppressive, that's too present, or an avant-garde in revolution that legislates an, a new law or proposes a new order. I'm interested in moments when, when neither of those options applies. And, and for me, this immediate post-war moment into the 50s, and indeed into the early 60s, uh, is such a moment. But it, this is all you know, driven by you know, the emergency of the last 20 years and much of my art criticism, um, well, political criticism too, has addressed this condition of intermittent emergency. So that, that's how the project came back to that, out. about how it relates both to the present moment and to an earlier moment of, of modernism. But before we do, I think it would be useful to sketch what the core attributes of positive barbarism are. Yeah, it's, um, again, <laughs> it's a little tendentious on my part to bring all these figures together. Um, but one thing I think they share is a, a commitment to brute materiality, um, you know, a vulgar materialism. Uh, and one thing that this commitment does um, is that it, it leads them to uh, think representation as disfiguration. That's actually the title of a series of uh, paintings by Jorn. Um, I don't think figuration was an option for them. And I don't think abstraction was really. They were both compromised. Um, so they, you know, part of this brute materiality is in a way to undo the very basis of representation to undo figure and ground. I mean, that's an old modernist project, but they do it through a, a well, not, not a base materialism, but a, a brute materialism. And it, it involves um, a very calculated uh, act of, of desublimation. Um, Dibethe in particular, Bataille of course too, very interested uh, in that, that project, how to, you know, Desublimate uh, representation. How how to desublimate the subject through representation? So, um, Dubuffet was called a cockaist. Um, Oldenburg uh, referred to his art as shit art. Um, they wanted to to get kind of down and, and dirty. So that's that's one thing that they they all have in common a, a desire to subvert. And in Yorn. Um, you know, again and again, he takes genres like the the portrait or the landscape of history painting and and does them dirty. Uh, so that that's one thing that they have in common. Um, another thing, not to mm -hmm. ramble on, they have a very um, ambivalent relation to language. They're, these uh, are artists uh, who are fabulous writers, and they experiment. With language, um, but they also uh, want to undo it. Uh, Dubuffet attacks it, and Oldenburg plays with it. Um, you know, Jorn writes like mad, and and Pelosi, um, is an extraordinary writer too. He he really uh, entangles uh, words. Um, they're they're interested in language, but they're they're hostile to it, and very much unlike say Duchamp, but I, I see this as a line very different from the Duchamp uh, genealogies. They want to ex-nominate language, the language of art. 
Um, what does that mean? How would you describe that? What does ex nominate mean? Well, for example, De Buffet says of our brood, this is one of his great definitions, uh, it is art that, that doesn't know its name. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a proper name. It's beyond and, the verbal? Yeah, maybe, or, or pre-verbal. I mean, this is his um, fantasy. I mean, there's this doesn't apply mm -hmm. to much of the art that he nominated, <laughs> you, you know. He says he wants to ex-nominate, but he nominated all kinds of different figures as art brute artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're caught in that tangle of um, how to attack language, but um, how to get out of language, but only only to get deeper, deeper into it. So that's, you know, that's another commonality. They were all fiercely anti-classical. Um, yeah, you, Jorn, you, Jorn, you know, was very happy to be called a, a vandal. They were also fiercely anti-humanist. But even there, they were, they were ambivalent. Um, Jorn said that he was an inhumanist, inhuman humanist. And Oldenburg said, I'm a bastard humanist. Mm -hmm. So they're, I think they're part of the humanist project still. One, one thing you draw out is some notion of a tabula rasa, the idea of this need to start from scratch or being forced to start anew. And I found myself thinking about how that idea might be set in contradistinction from a sort of modernist idea of tapula rasa. I'm thinking of Malevich and the sort of idea of a clean, clean sweep that you can you know, really start again um, with a, a blank slate. And here there's something I, I don't know how you would describe it exactly, but of things being mangled and the shards showing up again, it's not a it's not a very clean slate at all. And how would you describe that? Um, yeah, there's there's not uh, the utopian impulse that uh, some of our favorite modernists, you and I share many of them, had even um, after World War One. I. I mean, they had the uh, the impetus of social revolution. They had the impetus of technological transformation. I mean, and you know, their utopia was a reaction against the dystopia of the war too. I just don't think that was an option after World War II. And this is why for me, again, positive barbarism only really becomes emphatic after the second world war, not the first world war. But yeah, they they deal they all deal with remnants, relics. I mean, here you see Pelosi um, kind of stick uh, industrial fragments, old toys, old um, tools into wax to uh, cast through the lost wax process to begin to assemble his his figures. But his, his figures are never really figures, they're disfigured, they're, they're assembled as disassemblages, if, if that's a word. So yeah, the, the tabula rasa is very different, but they do seek foundations, um, or at least to ground again. And what really interests me is um, the impossibility of that project. And, and maybe philosophically, they, for me, these figures are somewhere between uh, the modernist claim on on a real tabula rasa and the post-structuralist uh, suspicion of of origins mm -hmm. that they're what I mean to say is that they purport to be foundational but they're almost um, deconstructive of la let because our brew for example is a concept that that falls apart um, as du buffet attempts it again and again. Um, Bataille, as he seeks, you know, the beginnings of man, the beginnings of art, um, never can can hold it, never can uh, grasp it. Um, so even though they're foundational, they in a way show the difficulty of foundationalism. And that really interested me as well. It's an interesting temporal framework too. It's almost um, what you suggest is a certain kind of push-pull that for several of your thinkers as they're thinking about the extinction of 
civilization. They're also searching for its origins or they're trying to move outside of history in some way or outside of language, I guess, in some way or another. Um, could you describe that kind of, that historical pull? Yeah, I mean, it, for me, it, it's, it's not the same thing as primitivism. Uh, I mean, if <laughs> some artists, some writers in the 19th century went to the peasant as an outside, and then modernists of the early 20th century went to the, the so-called primitive, this is an even more um, dramatic uh, search for a, a space time that is outside uh, this, the prehistoric. Um, so I want to see it as different, uh, you know, a different space time from primitivism. But the, the extraordinary thing, I think, is that this is a prehistory that cannot be thought outside of the specter of post-history. So the, the first man is often um, juxtaposed, even morphs in to the last man. Uh, and in Lascaux, in the Lascaux book, Bataille, you know, sees the caves almost as a as a bomb shelter, or as a you know, tomb. So, in the the very you know, search for the first man is the uh, the disclosure of of the end as well. So, it's a uh, in primitivism, of course, there's this extraordinary juxtaposition of the modern metropolis with uh, the colonial elsewhere, um, the colonial elsewhere brought, you know, violently into the modern metropole. The montage here is even more uh, dramatic. Um, and, you know, maybe that's, you know, part of the, the problem too. They kind of thrilled to this spectacle of first and last together. But it's a, for me, it's a different kind of uh, temporality than we see in other modernist moments. There, there's a way in which um, even, even though some want to, to hold on to the idea of a, of a dialectic, um, they can't quite, um, you know, Jorn has this wacky idea of trialectics. Pelosi talks about his theory of opposites. Oldenburg is obsessed with contraries, you know, street and the store, the soft and the hard. But um, in a way that the dialectical freezes here and there's a way in which um, they feel stuck historically. Maybe this had to do uh, with the Cold War that, um, you know, that they were iced down by this kind of brutal opposition between uh, the triumphalist uh, United States and the totalitarian Soviet Union. But, um, they feel stuck and you know, maybe um, at times today, again, we feel stuck. But one thing that um, came back to me again and again, um, in a letter to Alexander Kojev, who was of course the great interpreter of Hegel to this French generation of Bataille and de Buffet at least. Um, Bataille writes of his, um, unemployed negativity. It's a negativity without a, uh, without a political project, without a, um, a collective address, really. Um, and that, that problem of unemployed negativity is one I, I feel mm. uh, profoundly. Um, but they, you know, they do have glimmers of a, uh, of a, Collectivity. I mean, they're mirages in a way. Um, you know, Du Buffet has his man of the street. Um, Bataille has his little societies that were supposed to be models for communities to come. That was crazy. Um, Jorn actually has, you know, little collectives. He's a, a great um, kind of movement uh, joiner. And he, he's committed to collaborative projects. It's, it's not as if there's no social horizon for these artists, but they do feel, um, I think, stuck uh, 
historically and conflicted politically. They're, many of them are neither right nor left. Um, yeah, that's Warren, what I was going to ask. What are the politics of brutal aesthetics? Well, it's, you know, <laughs> uh, they're not pretty. Um, and Jorn uh, was a Marxist, wrote some extraordinary texts um, that I think we have to call Marxist. He obviously became a, a core member of the Situationists. Um, I mean, I think his politics, um, you know, the theory is not crystal clear, but the politics are clear, at least at, at that level. Um, you know, Bataille is, is the, maybe the most difficult case. I mean, that his investigation of fascism for many people then and now led him too close to fascism. Uh, Dubuffet too is quite equivocal. Um, you know, Oldenburg is a progressive figure. Um, Pelosi too. Um, but that doesn't say much. I mean, they're all um, damaged by an inability to think out of um, their own sexism, to think out of um, their own uh, Western metropolitan outlook. Even as they attempt again and again to get outside of it, they don't. They have very little to say about um, the anti-colonial movements of the, of the moment, for example. But, you know, I, to write about such figures is not to celebrate them. I mean, I, and I, you know, I thought again and again, you know, faut-il brûler uh, du buffet, but I, must we burn these people? Um, I don't no, know. But there's a way, uh, there's a question I wanted to ask you around that. So the protagonists in your book are all white. They're all Euro-American male artists. And, you know, in terms of surviving civilization, they're hardly alone in needing survival tactics and they might not even be the ones that need them most. So I guess one of my questions to you is, does this, does this term work for, could you, write, could you write a second book and have female protagonists who would work within the frame of um, brutal aesthetics or is there something that's necessarily masculine in what's at stake? Mm -hmm. um, and if so, what is that? Um, and well, that's a first a question. That's the first question that I have and then I have a follow-up. Yeah, no, I, um, it's, it's a very good question. I don't have a, a good answer. Um, you know, I could say that these are troubled men, threatened men, but that's not much of an excuse. Um, it could be that, you know, the search for a tabula rasa, even if it's not a clean tabula rasa, is a, is a boy quest. Um, I mean, there, there are times when I thought that um, in a way they identify not only with you know, Western civilization, but they identify with its destruction, that there's almost a thrill to see it um, become barbaric. And that that's like weird, um, <clears throat> narcissistic, masochistic, I'm not sure what to call it, maybe fascistic uh, tendency that, that runs through at least some of these figures. So I'm not, you know, I'm not sure if it, um, if it can be developed as a concept for artists who are women, artists who are queer, artists of color. Um, you know, it might be a, a stretch. I mean, it's beyond the temporal purview of my book to think about figures like Lee Bonacue or even Eva Hess in this way. Um, maybe you know, it's a way into Jack Whitten, maybe Mel Edwards, maybe Noah Purfoy, but um, maybe not too. Uh, so. Again, I, um, I don't have a particularly good answer. I, I think that might be a, a limit um, to these figures. It might be a limit to the book too. I found myself wondering if, you know, when you when, when their deep ambivalence about humanism, if that wasn't a deep ambivalence about a certain model of masculinity. I don't know. I mean, here um, I would, you know, offer up Oldenburg, who 
is so concerned against um, you know reified fragmented world that he he inhabits literally inhabits he's so concerned to reanimate um, subject object relations in ways that that sometimes uh, put into play um, gender reversals uh, you know he sexes objects in ways that are um, hard to define in any one way I mean he's he really runs with this um, desire to metamorphose and mm. that too might just be another um, masculinist exercise but in his case at least I don't think so I mean I, I think um, you know he was so deep into the marxo freudianism of his time that he you know when I uh, look at some of his objects um, I see a whole other possibilities of what it is to be a subject so I'd hold him out I guess I'm I'm I connected it up in my mind about some of the discussions you have written um, about notions of masculinity in the Dada era, about these battered, shattered, emasculated figures and how you might draw the distinction between that kind of avatar of masculinity and the one that you start to see in some of these um, brutal figures. Yeah, you know, I to be honest, I haven't um, thought about it in the, those terms. I mean, Pelosi is very taken up by Dada and surrealism. It's really his point of origin. And he does give us um, broken figures, I mean, figures who are not really figures. Um, at the same time, he is interested in uh, the representation of authority. Um, you know, I, I don't think that these are merely parodic figures. Mm -hmm. um, so you could say that they, you know, they resemble the kind of rickety assemblages of Ernst, for example, when he was a Dadaist. But um, these are, you know, bronze figures too. Uh, mm -hmm. So it doesn't, that, that connection doesn't quite work for me. But I also don't think that, um, again, that we can excuse um, these men or any man um, just on the score that they somehow act out a, a dysfunctionality. I don't think that gets as far. No, but it can be a meditation on masculinity, which is interesting in that sense. And in that sense, there's actually a through line of you as a writer um, on issues of masculinity that I think is interesting. Um, I know that we should be opening our conversation to questions. We should be. And I am surprised and confused at the audience for not having infinite questions and having asked them. We have no questions in the Q&A box. Mm. Please, this is everyone's second invitation. Here's a question right now from Piper Marshall. It says, thank you and what a great question from Leah, reusing this framework and extending it beyond the figures discussed. An artist who comes to mind could be Lee Lozano, whose self-proclaimed anti-feminism resonates as particularly brutal. Al, Leah, thoughts? Um, that's, that's a great suggestion. Um, but I, I don't know if the, if the project would be to somehow, um, you know, I, I don't think my project is to, to repeat the errors of De Buffet with Art Brute to come up with uh, exemplars and only to somehow recuperate them for a term or a category that might not work. Um, but I, you know, I appreciate the idea that it, it might work. I'm just, I'm not sure it's, it's for me to do. Leah, do you have a, any thoughts? She smiled. I bet Piper does actually, <laughs> knowing her. Um, I like, I, I like playing with these concepts as a way of understanding the limitations, the moments in which um, they might and might not. So I think it's actually a great exercise to try to play that out. Um, but I don't have an answer right now. I have another question mm -hmm. from an anonymous attendee who asks, can you talk more about how the cave paintings discoveries impacted this era of style? 
that was, I loved that section. Uh, the, the cave paintings affected which style? Uh, the emergent brutal aesthetics that you're sort of synthesizing and identifying in the book. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, like Bataille, Yorn, for example, uh, became interested in prehistory, in archaeology, in anthropology. And I think in, in this time, in the mid uh, 1940s, late 40s, early 50s, it was impossible to escape um, cave paintings. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I think that they were there to be there to be developed. But what's so different about, well, I suppose um, the sorcerer, if I can find him, um, the sorcerer is this hybrid figure um, who represents both the animal and the divine for Bataille. And there is a way in which he, this, this figure is creaturely in the way that I, um, I take up in relation to Yorn, but the, the grace that Bataille sees in the caves, um, the, the grace in any way in which the, the animals are depicted, um, that doesn't apply to the creatures in Yorn. So I'm not sure if there is this, that direct connection. I mean, again, one of the, the enigmas of the caves for Bataille is, you know, why is it that the animals are, are so beautiful and the man so schematic, so ugly? Um, and that, that sense of, um, of the, the gracious power of these figures, that's not carried forward in the disfiguration in uh, the art that I take up. It's not there in Pelosi, it's not there uh, in Oldenburg either. One so, thing that I learned in reading the, your, your section on this on the caves that I thought was fascinating was the degree to which the discovery of Lascaux was prompt, prompting a conversation about the nature of humanity itself and how could you draw a line essentially between what was human and what was um, non-human. Um, and it seems like it plays so well into this idea that you have of a very permeable border between the animal and the human. I, I, I like. I thought that part was really was really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, and actually, Bataille does note that after uh, the Holocaust, in which humans were treated as animals, after the bomb, in which humans were destroyed, slaughtered, industrially like animals, um, there has to be an a new, a different relation to the animal. And that's also, you know, that, that is what he seeks. Um, you know, for Bataille, the, the, the cave show us the, the beginnings of religion, of, of sacrifice, that, um, that abasement of the animal and the divinization of the animal at the same time. And he, he wants to reclaim that sense of the sacred in relation to the animal. So, you know, maybe there is a connection there. Maybe that there's a connection that resonates in the present as well. There's also a connection to the next question, although it's sort of an oblique connection. There's the relation between the human and the animal, which Bataille is so interested in working and pulling apart, and the, inter the relation between people and machines, which Palazzi is interested in breaking apart similarly. And this next question asks, what is Palazzi's God-making and image-breaking concept? What is his God making concept? God making and image breaking as part of the same. Yeah, and weirdly, he would flip back and forth between those two terms. Um, and this is, this is uh, a concern that runs throughout these figures. Um, that they, they, they don't think uh, creation um, outside of destruction. Construction and destruction are forced together. Um, but in terms of the machine, that um, the you know any thrill to the machine of the machine age, say, is gone, um, long gone. 
uh, there's no attempt um, to recover um, that, not just techno-utopianism, but technological progress. Um, in fact, um, I think Pelosi and Oldenburg are alike in this regard. They, uh, they want to pull um, the object not only away from the commodity, but also away from the machine. And Pelosi does so directly because he uses the bits and pieces of, of machines. So that there's, um, you know, there's, if we want to find a, an idea of a left with no future, no future that's given over to technological transformation, there's a precedent in this moment among these artists and writers. But there is, there is a, um, in Pelosi in particular, there's at times a, a combination of the machinic and the animal. I think I showed you uh, his crocodile, for example. He, he thought that um, uh, <clears throat> technological trans transformation had, had rendered the human inhuman. And one way to represent it was through this you know, animalistic robotic hybrid. Also, he was, he was fascinated by the figure of the monster. And the monster was everywhere in popular culture at this moment. Um, here's another question also related and also maybe a good question to spend a few minutes really thinking about before we close, which is moving beyond brutal aesthetics. Um, your book is historically situated pretty precisely, even though it's pretty recent. You know, the latest images in the book come from the 70s. And Joe Bucciero asks, this might be precisely beside the point, but how do you think about the work these artists made after the period you cover? I'm thinking mainly of Oldenburg and Pelosi's subsequent quasi-pop turns. How does that material dilate or trouble some of your terms? Your term is positive barbarism, history, maybe even sovereignty in a new political moment, God-making, image-breaking. Big question. Yeah. I know Joe. I know where he lives. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know where he lives. This is just a, a way to stall a little bit because I, I don't have a very good answer. Um, I think, uh, you know, for an art historian, as a teacher or curator, and maybe Leah can respond um, here too, we don't stack the, the decks, but we do look for our cards. So. We do frame things in such a way that we can make a case, make an argument work. And um, sometimes it kills me when artists outlive my argument for them. And they go on to do work that um, seems to negate what I thought was most important about the project. Um, this is a way to say that uh, after um, you know, the mid-1960s, Pelosi uh, is an artist that doesn't interest me much. But for a good 10 years before, he does profoundly. Um, Oldenburg, I love all the way through. And I, uh, I think he comes back to some of these um, you know, brutish concerns at particular moments. He doesn't merely go pop at any point. But there is a way in which the, the frame of my book is the positive barbarism of Benjamin and, if you like, the, the spectacle of Guy Debord. There's a way in which um, the concerns of my artists and the terms um, that I find to treat them only make sense within that frame. Uh, so they live on, <laughs> we live on, but um, things change and you know, I, I didn't want to follow them to the very last breath. Do you see um, brutal aesthetics outliving these five figures and sort of forming a countercurrent or a small side appearance in what comes after the 60s? It, is there a brutal aesthetics today that you can speak of? And here's a question from someone named Nyla Goldfarb. 
uh, the named artists aside, how do we live with these ideas into the wreckage of the wreckage of then, otherwise known as today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, hmm. Another good question. Uh, you know, I, I do think that this idea of positive barbarism, maybe this notion of brutal aesthetics does open out um, a different idea of modernism. And even though I say it's, it's specific to a particular uh, historical cultural frame, I, I think one can find um, antecedents, one can find legacies. Um, here's one, I mean, if there, in the 1990s, when after a, a fascination with the image, with uh, the text, everything was image, everything was text under very um, difficult conditions, the AIDS epidemic, the attack on the welfare state, uh, the kind of full um, brunt of neoliberalism, there was a turn um, to a, not a base materialism, not a brute materialism, but about a, a bodily materialism. I think there was a, um, a version of a brutal aesthetics uh, that emerged at that, that point when uh, the body, the damaged body became um, the, you know, the, the way to think about the present. And, you know, I'm not, I can't um, see the present, let alone the future, but there, there might be a way in which uh, a sort of survivalist aesthetic um, has the conditions again um, to be developed, um, but it would take a, a different form. I don't know, I'd, I was so focused on, you know, my attempt to get this stuff straight, I, I couldn't really see beyond it. But I hope others will. Leah, yeah, do you have any final thoughts? No, but you talked about it as a three-part study earlier in the introduction. Um, so I guess I do wonder, this is part two, right? There's a there's something coming. <laughs> um, maybe a a prequel, not a sequel. I mean, I I think you know these little books of uh, art criticism, political criticism I've done over the last several years, like Bad New Days and What Comes mm -hmm. After Farce. They're really written out of a sense of intermittent emergency that we've lived through for the entire 21st century. Um, so that that's the first part. Um, and the project proceeds in reverse chronology. Brutal Aesthetics is the second part. And I, I feel that I have to go back to um, the moment before World War I and the interwar period to think about um, that moment of emergency when the very idea of emergency, the very idea of exception begins to be thought as a concept um, to think about, you know, why is it that the futurists were bound up with a figure like Georges Sorel? You know, why, why is it that Carl Schmitt thought that Hugo Ball was his greatest interlocutor? Um, you know, there, those are the connections I want, want to think next, but, um, you know, like Star Wars, it's a, it's a prequel. I go, I go back into the empire, not away from it. Good luck. Stay safe. The empire is dangerous. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Ethan. And thanks, Leah. Really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for checking it. Thank checking you it for being here. Thank you to the audience. Don't forget, we have uh, books for sale. Go to our website, go to our Instagram, email booksmomops one at artbook.com. They can be signed by Hal. They will be signed by Hal. Um, with any other questions, comments, cares, please, it's easy to get in touch with us these days. Social media is everywhere. Um, thank you all for your time and your patience and your generosity. Uh, I appreciate you. <laughs>